one I like, oh there it is, basically means that you can shunt the coil down to pretty much, I'll draw the coil in red, let's imagine you've got a particular stroke going negative, that's down towards the back of the driver, theoretically you can shunt the coil all the way down there to just inside the gap, and you can measure that distance, and vice versa. So when you look at a Mark Audio driver, we will actually quote 8mm one way or 6mm one way. That means under maximum load, you can move that coil 6mm in that direction or 6mm in that direction, you get a total movement. Now obviously Scott will come on to how you can use that later and what the limitations are. Other manufacturers quote in terms of uh, distortion. The problem with that is that it's it's a it's a sort of um, uh, it's a measurement that, that I don't think in a way helps helps guys like yourself because um, it's 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 something of a contrived um, mathematical calculation. Uh, I would not I would now not say to you guys right if you were buyers and you came to me and said. Uh, uh, we want a low distortion driver. I go, okay, give me the specification for low distortion. You know, give me the parameters that you guys want to see. And then nobody can really come up with a, you know, what is a standard definition of distortion? You can measure distortion, second, third, harmonic distortion. But again, what is distortion to you? You think, oh, that's not a nice sound. To you will be, ooh, that's interesting. Problem. I'm a mechanical engineer. I can't handle all that. I'm getting too old. But I can tell you physically that the coil will remain operational within a certain mechanical movement. Okay. okay. What you will find though is this. When you go to look at Thiel and Small, most manufacturers will give you some approximation of how far their cone, their, their cone or their powertrain subassembly, cone and coil, will move. Fostec will say X max is two millimeter. I think Tang Bang similarly. About that. Fostec's going to have some of their drivers at 0.15 yeah. millimeter right. sight. Well, yeah, but there's about five. I, I actually yeah. tried a few years ago to count count the number of methods for providing a number for X max. Mm. I gave up at six. Yeah. And they all give different results and apply to the same driver. Go back to my go back to my little formula twenty percent fact you know, 80% is the rest is a bit of rubbish. Just have a look when you look at the tech specs for drivers. And if they, if they say X max and they give it in millimetres and it's two mil and it's got a very high SPL, that, tell you, that tells you that's a traditional old school full range driver. And then you'll be over to Scotland and big boxes, and because you're going to have to extract very, you know, its, it, its ability to produce low frequency will be very limited, and therefore you've got to be very fancy with your box design. Okay. You well, sometimes you have to be careful with this SPL as well, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Because um, some people keep a very high sensitivity, but of course, you know, it depends where we've measured that. You know, some of them might be like four <laughs> yeah. ohms, I mean, some of them might be eight ohms or sixteen ohms. Exactly. Some of them might be measured yeah. at two point yeah. eight volts. Yeah. Some might be measured yeah. at a watt. Yeah. You know, Sadly, there's, uh, and the guys will cover, these two guys will cover that stuff in greater detail than me. That, unfortunately, again, when you look at the theater and small parameters, they are not uniform. Um, um, you do need to look at, the, the, as, as Stefan said, the rating of the driver. Is it a 4 ohm coil, mm -hmm. 6 or an 8 ohm coil? Mm -hmm. Most of our coils are between 6 to 8 ohms, fairly standard stuff. Uh, the, uh, the small drivers like the Alpair 5s are 4 ohm. Um, but, but generally, as a general rule, just have a look for those, those basic hard facts. Moving mass, um, you're correct. You know, physically, how far will the driver move? SPL is another one. If it's very, very high, Plus 90 dB for a relatively small driver or mid-sized driver. That that will say to you if you're into vocal music and not much more. Well, that could be a good driver for you. 
possibly, and you want to build, you know, a bigger box. And you've got a big room. Hmm, okay, you could be doing stuff with that. Um, so it's things like that that you need to look for. And Stefan will be able to tell you more anyway when you need help, should you be buying a Mark Audio driver. So that that is, does that help you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah look, I'm, I'm, I'll come clean, I'm playing with open baffles. <laughs> and, and so you yeah. lose... Yes. You lose the efficiency from the box yeah. and you run out of travel very quickly. Yeah. Mm. But I just wanted to mm. feel for where the limits are. When you see the cone, it's like there's linearity and if it's going too far, you're not you're going to yeah. introduce this. Generally, like for open baffle, um, Scott again will, and Stefan will help us more. Uh, typically, um, uh, just as a manufacturer, from my own particular manufacturing hat on, Normally, uh, if, I, if somebody asks me to make an open baffle driver, my first instinct will be to go for cone acreage. In other words, uh, build a, uh, a large cone driver and keep the X max down. You know? Sorry? Um, yeah. Uh, because you've got to, because you're you, you're free to atmosphere, you're venting free to atmosphere, mm. and um, Scott again will cover this in much more detail than me because I, if I run out of steam, you know, I'm a man of, I'm a driver bloke, not not not. These guys are box blokes. Ask me to talk about cones and all that. I'm a happy boy, but um, that would be my instinct. Just to let you know that. I mean, yeah, obviously fine. Scott can give you more detail. It's obviously when you're modelling the driver to start mm. up with before you actually yeah. started with any bits of you know, mm. theorising about it and coming up with mathematical models. Now I can see obviously that um, you know the movement of the cone is obviously mm. proportional to presumably the electromagnetic force that mm. we're applying to it. Yes. Uh, in the historic <coughs> section. Um, but when you move obviously into the higher range and the cone starts resonating. Um, you know, how's, how's the maths of that work? And presumably that's a different set of maths to the you know, proportionality with the AMF. And presumably also there's a band where we go from one to the other. Yeah, the transition. Model all that. Points of transition. This is where we're into the black art stuff. You know, we are talking about science and an art earlier. Where, funnily enough, the science is still partially known. And uh, Ted, the late Ted, was right. It is, it becomes a value judgment. When I'm, when I'm designing a cone profile, the shape of it, uh, so usually there are at least three different radii. That's the cone neck, so it's quite tight we get out the radius gets wider and then when you get out further still it gets wider still hmm I have to do an awful lot of balancing here on the one hand mm, if I want to control the resonance very closely I could make the cone quite sort of steep like that you know that makes my life easier the cone will be more rigid its um, ability to handle oscillation is, um, if you like, the, what we call the oscillatory load. Oh, it's much better, but I've got a problem. I'll, I'll basically produce, I won't be producing a speaker, I'll, I'll be producing a megaphone for you guys. <laughs> be a megaphone. <laughs> the, the directivity of it will be so, the angle of dispersion will be so narrow, you'll hate me. Because you'll have to sit in that chair there and anybody else won't hear anything. So, hmm, that's a problem. So Mark Fenham thinks, okay, I can't do that. So I've got to produce a wide cone to increase the angle of dispersion, okay? Oops, big problem. Now, the centre section of the cone wants to go that way. Meanwhile, the outer section of the cone wants to stay put and it starts to bend like a banana. <laughs> Oops, very unstable. Not too long before we break cones. So you can guess, there's a huge amount of work that I've had to do over the years to, to get the, um, 
to actually get the balance right. Now, there is no formula yet. There's no Einstein formula. There's nobody, uh, despite, what's that guy? Um, Martin thinking yesterday that we were talking to. Oh, Martin uh, Yeah, and all these guys. You, you, will, you, will, you can go now and download or buy probably anything of a dozen books on loudspeaker design and build. And they'll actually be very useful and helpful. But remember my 20% fact and 80% rumor and myth equation. So when you read these books, you're going to get 20% It's going to be useful to you. The rest, just chuck it in the bin. Seriously. Sorry to... I don't want to disappoint these guys, but honestly, forget it. Because um, the reality is, we don't know. So, there's so. no that cone profile and the transition point from oscillation, mechanical oscillation, to resonance is something the way I work it is I go into my workbench, I have something probably in the order of about 200 different cone profiles I've made over the years. I build them, test them, wreck them and go, that didn't work, go back to the bench, start with another profile, build that, test it, wreck it, and I suspect you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <'cause> <laughs> I think, you know, and eventually, I come up with a set of profiles for a given grade of material, for a given cone surface area, for a given size of coil, for a given motor strength, flux in the gap, and come up with a workable operational driver which I can then go and measure and say to you guys, right, it produces a frequency of free air of 70 hertz at uh, 88 dB, and its operational range is likely to be from that to 22 kilohertz. Uh, and here's the frequency range, guys, and here's the impedance chart. And it's got a total Q of that, so you can calculate your box. And it's got a moving mass of that. So you guys can make a judgment as to whether it's the sort of drive that you might like. And that is about as far as we can physically go. Quick question on that. Are you mm -hmm. using CE techniques, FEA, to model cones and drive brakes and things like that? Oh, yeah. Well, I actually... I actually... Well, it now has transferred. I actually had a... Um, A, a, um, an isolation chamber with a sort of half ton concrete bed on it and um, a laser system where I can physically project onto the cone surface a dedicated bank of lasers to measure in a micro resonance area what the cones are doing. So you're measuring the mode shape mm. the cone is mm -hmm. taking. Yeah. Yeah. And then the skill is yeah. getting that, so you yeah. get mode shapes yeah. for as many frequencies mm. as you can, making a flat response. Mm. Well, not not even a flat response. I mean, you know, actually, the great thing about a flat response driver, a flat response driver sounds a flat response driver sounds like that very flat, very flat. Uh, and really, there are probably left in the world now maybe about ten. I oh, said it's very sad. There's probably only about 10 or 12 true original driver designers left. Sadly, Ted Jordan has recently died. I'm on limited bandwidth. <laughs> uh, Matt Sabarasan, who I work with, who's brilliant. Brilliant guy, but he's got prostate cancer. So he's 68. He was the father of the FE range of Drivers, we work together. I wish he was here today. You guys would love to meet him. He's a brilliant player. Bloody brilliant. Better than me. I'm mechanical. He's old school, you know. <coughs> and there'll be a few more dotted around. And all of us stood here today can go through, and I really hope I bore the pants off you with the mechanics of this stuff, and find up a load of equations on how we develop flux density in the gap and all that. But you'll all fall asleep and it doesn't help you. Um, 
And none of us can stand here and, and honestly say to you, this, you know, if you do it like this, this will produce a rippingly good sound. What we can say to you is, there are certain types of driver design that might suit your needs. And we've talked about moving mass and heavy duty drivers if you're, if you're into Led Zeppelin and all that and Bruce Dickinson. And if you're into something a bit lighter then, you know, and you want to hear detail and you want a, a more purist single point source type system where you want to get one pair of ears, one pair of drivers and you want to produce a very sort of uniform sound with a lot of detail, well, single, single, uh, single point source drivers, i.e. Uh, full range drivers will, will, will very, very likely suit you very well. And if you're somewhere in between and you do want a bit of bass and you want, um, you want, you want some flexibility in your system, you want to be able some days to play a bit of heavy rock, maybe not crazy loud, but you still want that delicacy in detail, that's where Mark Audio Driver comes in. Because it's the, as far as we know, it's the only full range driver that can handle some bass because of the way it's designed. Uh, and, and that really is it. Um, I hope I'm not disappointing you all, that's the thing. Good, But it's a, you know, it's a heads up, honest effort of where we're at. I think the load. Yeah. <laughs> 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 all right, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you very no, much. Very much. Indeed. Indeed. Thank you.